Hey, Steve here. As always, this episode of BJJ Mental Models is brought to you by BJJ Mental Models Premium. Check it out at premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. If you like the public podcast feed here, there's a ton more stuff there for you. If you want to support the show and help keep the lights on, signing up for premium is the way to do it. There's tons of strategic courseware content there, as well as access to our awesome community. And black belts like myself are more than happy to review your rolling footage if you're a member of Premium. So please do consider it premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Again, that's premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Thanks again, and as always, enjoy the show. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 144. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, rolling again here on the podcast, but this time with one of our most requested guests ever, Rob Gray from the Perception and Action Podcast. Rob, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Steve. Thanks for having me here. No worries. Yeah, our community has been asking for you <laughs> for a long time. In the jiu-jitsu world, there is a lot of attention and a lot of momentum being picked up when it comes to sports science. Mm-hmm. This is an area in jiu-jitsu where really the sport is very primitive. Most instructors don't have a coaching background. They're just retired competitors who decided one day to open up a gym and they start teaching people and basically they just copy the techniques that worked from for them. But one of the things that our community has brought up over and over again is the importance of the constraints led approach to coaching. Mm -hmm. This is something that I'd actually never even heard of until recently when I was exploring new and better ways to teach students. And people said that, hey, this is proven science that works for sports. And it actually when upon looking at it and what it preaches What I found is that a lot of the best practices that you can get from the constraints led approach actually are kind of some of the things that my favorite instructors have done, whether they realized Mm -hmm. or not that they were doing it. And so I'd love to maybe dig into that. But before we do, how about just a quick introduction so that all of our listeners are familiar with your work? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. That's a great point. I hope we that comes across today. Like a lot of the science, I think, just naturally connects with sometimes we call it experiential knowledge of coaches, what they're already doing, what they already figured out. So I think that's a great point to start with. But yeah, so I am a professor at Arizona State University. I've been doing it for a long time. Kind of my background's more psychology side of things. And over the years, I've studied kind of perception side of things and more recently got into the idea of skill acquisition. You know, how can we design practice better to make people acquire skills that are a bit more quickly, a bit more pressure proof. So they don't, I studied that for a long time, kind of choking under pressure um, and kind of making athletes that are also more adaptable. They can come up with new and creative ways to do things. So I do kind of, you mentioned my podcast, I do kind of research studies where I compare different coaching methods in the lab, instructional methods. And then I also kind of do a lot of consulting. My main sports I work in are in baseball and soccer and golf. So my knowledge of uh, martial arts, the details of it are are limited, but I'm going to try to to kind of extend some of the ideas to it for sure. (laughs) No worries. No worries. I think what we'll probably find is that a lot of these concepts are totally applicable across the board here. I know that a lot of the coaches in our community advocate for a constraints-led approach, and they do recommend your podcast. And hey, normally we do the plugs at the end, (laughs) but we might as well do a sandwich here. If those of you out there are interested in listening to concepts that are spoken by someone more intelligent than me, (laughs) you can go to perceptionaction.com. That's where Rob's podcast is. So if you like this show, but you're looking for something that's actually more grounded in science, definitely check out Rob's work. With that said, Rob, I'd love to learn more about the constraints-led approach here, and maybe you could help me out here. What exactly is it? It first came onto my radar when a giant textbook by, I think, Dr. Ian Renshaw, is that his name, Mm -hmm. I think was sent my way, and I'm frankly not smart enough to decode it, (laughs) so (laughs) I had to have someone kind of dumb Mm -hmm. it down to my level, and I I think I have a cursory understanding, but I'd love for for you to maybe just quickly explain, when we talk about the constraints-led approach to coaching, what exactly does that mean? 
Yeah, so the, the standard way that we kind of explain this is by comparing and contrasting it to more traditional way we think about skill and coaching. So the traditional way we think about skill is that there's one correct technique to do things. So I always use the example of when I took golf lessons as a kid, you know, you you hold your feet this far apart, you bend your knees this much, you keep your eye head down, so on. So the coach knows the solution and the technique and they're prescribing it to the athlete to follow. And the idea of skill is to be able to do this repeatable movement, right? To have, you know, we talk a lot about repetition and automaticity to do the same one correct technique over and over. And so that's been kind of the dominant view for the long time. The alternative view that's kind of emerged, it's been around for, for a long time too, but it's became more popular in the recent years is that that's not the way that skill works. Skill really works through a process that you term you hear is self-organization, where our body kind of organizes itself almost like a flock of birds moves and, and will, so it doesn't, there's not one correct way to, to move. There's actually, you need to move in lots of different ways. And the way that skill happens, we become skillful is the term you hear, another term you hear is it emerges, right? So we get these constraints imposed on us, right? We have individual constraints from our own body, our strength, our height, our, our reach. We have environmental constraints of the surface we're on, if there's wind. And then we have task constraints, which are the kind of the rules of our sport or the conditions we're fighting in under or playing under. And the idea is that Instead of trying to give the athlete the solution, here's how you move, what I'm going to do is manipulate the constraints in practice in some way to kind of push the athlete and guide them to find their own solution, their own become their own movement problem solver, they're adaptable. And that, that's kind of the basic overall idea of it. And we, I guess we can go into more specifics as we go along. Absolutely. And like I, I mentioned when we were getting acquainted, one of the adorably stupid things about Brazilian jiu-jitsu as a sport and just in terms of how immature the coaching <laughs> is. Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it, it kind of came around because it, it was effective as a, a self-defense and I, I suppose a street fighting technique. And the way that the the Gracies, the originating family from Brazil, popularized this was they would basically just do pressure testing. They would go to other gyms and they would fight people from other martial arts and demonstrate that Brazilian jiu-jitsu could beat their opponents. So they would go into, you know, other gyms, they'd beat up bodybuilders, they'd go and they'd beat up like kickboxers and they'd demonstrate that Brazilian jiu-jitsu was effective by the fact that they could beat up these other people. Mm -hmm. And in the 90s, that was basically what the UFC originally was. It was a kind of a scheme actually involving the Gracies to demonstrate <laughs> the superiority of the sport. So one of them went in with a, a BJJ background and won the tournament. And so <laughs> the history of BJJ has been very much trial by fire. You go into a competition, you fight people, and that's how you prove your dominance. And mm -hmm. hey, like th that, that kind of competitive pressure is definitely a great way to figure out, you know, who's on top, but it's not a great way to teach and to learn. And unfortunately, that that kind of mindset of, you know, like survival of the fittest, it trickles over to the way that coaches teach. I remember when I started Brazilian Jiu Jitsu back in, I think 2008, I really wanted to get into martial arts and I decided that this is the martial art I wanted to do. So when I went in on my first class, they basically, without really giving me any instruction or telling me what I was going to do, they just threw me into there in the shark pit with a bunch of other people and said, go. Like, I, I barely know what the sport is. I barely know what the rules are. Basically, the only thing they tell you is, here's how you tap out. And when you inevitably lose, make sure you tap out so the guy doesn't break your arm or choke you unconscious. That's the only thing they tell you. So I go in there and I'm just getting absolutely annihilated. And that's the way that to this day, most coaches teach Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's all about survival of the fittest. And they, they will just take new people and just throw them in there to the shark tank. And the idea is... If they just get mauled long enough, you know, eventually they'll they'll learn and, and they'll get better and mm -hmm. they'll get better. And it, it works. It works, but it's not efficient. And 
I've always felt that part of the reason it might take so long for people to get black belts in this sport is because we just don't teach it very well. You know, there, there really is no, it's not even a matter of whether there's a constraints led approach to coaching. In fact, in, in most gyms, I would say there isn't even really an approach to coaching. They just, you know, they come in, they instructors will show one or two random things a day and then people just fight. So that, that is one of the unique characteristics of jujitsu, which is that the, the coaching model is very immature at best, I would say. Yeah, that that's pretty common in other sports. And I think that's also kind of a, a misconception people have sometimes about the constraints that approaches. So what you describe, I would make an analogy to a lot of sports and kind of game based coaching where, OK, we recognize that doing the really restrictive kind of fake activities is no good. So we'll just let them play all the time. <laughs> we'll just let them play a game of soccer all the time and they'll figure it out or just let them spar all the time and they'll figure it out. And kind of, I think, I like to think, you know, constraints that approach is different than that, right? We're not just letting them completely figure it out on their own and, like you said, and lose. And <laughs> that, that that works in some ways, but the, the coach definitely has more of a role than that to try to, you know, watch the fight and recognize, oh, they're not taking this opportunity to get this hold or they're not, they're standing too far away from their opponent or they're weak on this side. And the idea is for the coach to recognize those things and step in and add some constraint that's going to kind of push the athlete in a direction, a better direction, right? So mm -hmm. it's the common misconception. A, a lot of times when you use the word self-organization or something is it's completely hands-off coaching. You just let them go and figure <laughs> it out, which it's really not. I think that's an important point. Got it. Got it. So let's maybe talk about self-organization here, because like you said, you know, we've talked on the past on this podcast about things like the reverse classroom model, which appeals to a lot of people because to some extent you're letting the students drive and it can empower them. But the thing that a lot of coaches that I know have found is when they try that stuff, it sounds like it should be really easy. Right. It sounds like if you're letting mm. the students drive the education, it should be the easiest thing in the world, because as a coach, you don't have to prep. <laughs> but in the real world, what people that I know have actually found is when they try to implement these systems, it's actually way harder because you have to really think at an individual level about what each one of your students is doing. <laughs> right. And a lot of coaches just simply don't have that kind of diligence. You know, they come in and they want to show one thing to the whole class and then just let them go. What they don't necessarily want is to have to pay deep attention to what every single person is doing and kind of help them along their journey. Yeah, for sure. It, it, it You're right. It, it definitely has more of an athlete-centered individual focus. And that is hard. <laughs> like, like we recognize that like, and I can sympathize that and like as a professor, you know, the easy way for me to teach is teach everyone the same and then give everyone the same exam. Everyone knows we could be doing it a lot better <laughs> if I, <laughs> you know, individualize people's instruction and based on how, what they know. And, but you're right. It is a lot more work and it's harder to, to kind of do that for sure. Well, well, maybe give me an example here of this thing in action. So okay. baseball, it sounds like, is an area that you work in a lot. And I'm assuming that a lot of the ideas here will be analogous to, to most other sports. But in baseball, I mean, the example of, you know, just letting people do their thing, like you said, might be you just get everyone together and you say and the coach just says, OK, guys play baseball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. and that's the extent of the coaching experience. And that I would say is analogous to what a lot of jujitsu coaches do. How would in the context of baseball, how would a constraints led approach look in practice? What would the coach do and how would they structure the session? Yeah. So well, let me give it, yeah, I can give it baseball and then maybe one a bit closer to your sport. I, so, so my, my favorite example that I use a lot of in, in baseball is, is a called a connection ball. So one of the things I have to address with baseball pitchers and hitters, and so the first place it starts is, you know, you have an athlete doing something, you're observing them as a coach, and you recognize something you want to change about the way they're moving, right? And, it, and I think it's really critical to, as a coach, ask why, <laughs> why do I want to change this? What's this do? And is it just because I don't like how it looks or is it there's a better way they could do it. And one of the examples I use in, in baseball pitching, right? So when you throw a ball, some pitchers, especially younger ones, tend to do this thing where they, during their delivery, which, you know, involves kind of the whole body, they're separating their arm from the body, kind of snapping it to generate more speed. Mm -hmm. And one that kind of, you know, I'm sure you've talked about this on your podcast before, you know, that there's a kinetic chain you get from the ground up your body to generate force. Yep. And you're breaking that for one thing. And then also you're putting all this force in your elbow and pitchers are renowned for having a blowing their elbow ligament and having to get resurgery. So 
So the old way that we would do that to get rid of that problem is give lots of it, you know, bodily focused instruction, like try to correct them, you know, keep your arm in, keep your elbow at this angle, do that, which I've never been able to get to work. <laughs> Instead, <laughs> what I do is I add a constraint. So I'm a constraint, I'm going to change what they're doing to try to push them away. So one of the first things you're trying to do with a constraint set approach is you're trying to destabilize their existing movement solution. So whatever they're doing, you don't want it to work anymore, right? In martial arts, one constraint you could add is reducing the space that you're allowed to be in, like the boundaries. That's going to take the, the strategy of staying away from your opponent away, right? So you have to be close to them. So that, that's kind of the first principle. So what I do is I take this rubber, kid's rubber ball, basically, and put it under your arm as a pitcher. And I tell you, I want you, while you're pitching, I want you to make this connection ball, this big rubber ball, go forward towards where you're throwing the, the baseball. So what that does is if you separate your arm from your body, it won't. It'll fall back and go backwards or sideways. So I'm, I'm adding something that's taking away what's not working. And I'm doing it for a reason, but I'm not in any way telling the athlete how to get it to work or how to fix it. I'm just letting them explore and kind of self-organize and figure out how do I move differently so I get this connection ball, the silly constraint <laughs> that he's added to work to the ball going forward. And inevitably they do. It's not a conscious thing. They can't really explain, but they just, you, you're trying to get them to explore and try different ways to move is kind of the basic principle. And so, you know, as I mentioned in team sports, you know, in some of the soccer and hockey I work in, we, we, you can reduce spacing, reduce to make athletes have to work in closer quarters. You can take away, you know, you're not allowed to use your left hand, you know, to force them to do things like that. So there's a lot of different ways. It's really unlimited kind of methodology. But the, the basic idea is, yeah, you, you want to try to, I, I like to think, you know, taking something away, that's why we call it constraint. You're constraining mm -hmm. them in some ways, but you're also pushing them and getting them to explore new ways to do it. Oh, I see. So, so that's kind of the basics. Yeah. I really like how you mentioned that the coach is not prescribing a solution, but they're putting constraints on the players so that the players have to get to the right solution in their own way. That's a really interesting point. Mm -hmm. And an area where my sport, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, we frankly fail at it a lot. It, it is a sport that in terms of the way it is commonly coached, it is very prescriptive. There's a lot of put your hand here and put your foot here and not a lot of explanation as to why and not a lot of consideration into how an individual person can actually get to the right spot on their journey. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem that I encountered when I was coming up in the sport. I had a real hard time for quite a while because I was just trying to follow the rote instructions that my instructor would give me without really understanding why or without really being able to put my own stamp on it. And I was going through motions that weren't working. And at the end of the day, what I eventually realized is this, it's because I wasn't following the right concepts. I was trying to follow these detailed steps without knowing how they all fit together. And in terms of what I was actually trying to achieve, very common problem in, uh, in jujitsu. An example I can give of the constraints led approach in jujitsu that I love, a common mistake that fighters make in in jiu-jitsu is they're very concerned about what they want to do but they fail to take into account what their opponent is doing so it's very common for a grappler to get in their mind okay i want to get in close and grab this guy and do xyz and so they'll get in close and they'll, they'll try to grab the guy but they won't pay attention to the fact that the other guy is trying to grab them <laughs> at the same time which matters a lot in jujitsu whoever gets the grips first is probably going to be the one who gets to pull off what they want to do it's it's an art where your ability to latch onto a person and get leverage is really one of the most important things so if you just zombie walk towards someone and you're only thinking about yourself and not what the other person is doing, you can be totally blind to the fact that actually you're the one who, who is about to, you know, get submitted without even realizing that that's happening. So a constraints led approach that I often use when I'm coaching is I tell people, okay, we're not going to do the jujitsu stuff. We're only going to focus on gripping. Mm -hmm. So you guys walk toward each other and your job is to grab the other person. 
without them getting a good grip on you. And as soon as someone gets a dominant grip, you just reset and start again. So basically, you're almost taking the the grappling part out of it completely. And you're focusing on just the engagement phase. Like, how do you how do you walk up and grab someone effectively? And I found that to be one of the most effective ways to to supercharge people's effectiveness of the martial art, because now all of a sudden they get really, really good at making sure that they're the ones with the dominant grips, which in jujitsu is so important. If you just tell people, <laughs> you know, make sure you get good grips and make sure they don't grip you. Well, I mean, that sounds good on, on its surface and it makes sense, but people often have a hard time turning that into something actionable. Whereas I find that it, that little game that I play where I actually take out a lot of the grappling part and say, focus on the grips, that actually proves to be extremely helpful in terms of getting people to understand and, and apply how that stuff is supposed to work in practice. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that example, Steve. I think that illustrates a lot of uh, key points. I think, you know, we have this kind of the way, the traditional way we teach skills in a lot of sports and in martial arts too, is we, what do we call decompose them, right? So I'm going to teach you how to punch or hold against a punching bag or a dummy. I'm going to break the skill out of the context and teach it to you how to do the fundamentals, and then I'm going to try to plug it back in. Mm -hmm. And what you find is that example, exact example you give, because you don't know when to use it, right? You don't know when to use the whole... And the the expression I use, if you listen to my podcast at all, I always end it with, keep them coupled is my phrase. And what I mean by that is, you know, our movements are driven by information, right? You reach to hold someone because there's an opening on their body or they're leaning a certain way or, right? And to me, in, in practice, as much as possible, it's critical that we keep the movement coupled with the information. And that that's what, so instead of breaking the skill apart, let's just practice grabbing a dummy and doing holds would be the, the technique for holds. I really like what you're doing there. That's approach I would call a simplification. So you're keeping the thing coupled. You're still, the holds are driven by what your opponent's doing, but you simplify the task by taking the rest of the, the mar- the fighting out of it. Right. Mm-hmm. So I really, that's a great example, Steve. Definitely. Do you see any real benefit in terms of just drilling against a dummy because this this is a hot topic of conversation mm-hmm. in the jujitsu world it's uh something that people often refer to as dead drilling where you are basically drilling a technique outside of a realistic setting without any resistance so maybe you are drilling on a dummy or maybe you are drilling against an opponent who is just acting like a dummy meaning they're giving you no resistance whatsoever and a common problem that people have is when they drill that way they can technically follow the instructions against a non-resisting opponent, but as soon as they try to apply it in practice, the whole thing goes out the window. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on whether there's value in that kind of repetitive drilling outside of a live environment or whether that should be done away with. Yeah, that's a great question, Stephen. I get that pretty much in every sport I work in, you know, coaches that are even like really into the constraints that approach are kind of resistant to get rid of, you know, the fundamentals, as I call them, you know, training the unopposed technique, you know, in it, almost any sport, dribbling in soccer and stick handling and other sports. So I personally would like to reduce that as much as possible. And I particularly think as now when people have so much time to themselves to work with, That when you get a chance and you have other athletes around and they're working with you as a coach, I really think you should be getting rid of all of that, right? If they really want to do that, they can do it on their own. How many opportunities do they have to actually work with another opponent or the coach? You know, so it drives me crazy, for example, in soccer, when I see kids standing in line to wait to dribble a ball around cones and they have a whole <laughs> field of opponents, right? They're spending all week at home in their backyard by themselves. Now they have a bunch of opponents and you're not using them. So I'm not a big, big believer in it. I know a, a lot of coaches, I think you can still, and there's some research, for example, in, in soccer, like with small sided games. So they show that you do develop kind of the basic techniques even if you let people kind of play, like doing what you did, you know, your holds example, you will develop the basic holds technique in that manner, even in the same way that you would if you, you did unopposed isolated drills. So I really don't, I think they should be minimized, but other people certain sometimes see value in them. I guess there may be some cases where someone's really, really struggling and they're not getting it at all. Maybe you need to take them out and really do something like that. But I'm not a big fan of them, definitely. 
Yeah. This is also a very common problem in the jiu-jitsu world where there is traditionally a very big emphasis on starting the class with like a, a warm up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that involves a lot of drills that are supposed to be sport specific. But a lot of the time you're doing drills that have absolutely nothing to do with the sport, like jumping jacks and stuff. And I mean, mm -hmm. Jiu-jitsu is an expensive sport, right? In a lot of cities, you can be spending well over a hundred dollars a month on this, plus the cost of very expensive equipment. So it's a sport that can really only be done with another human being. You can't mm -hmm. go play jujitsu by yourself. So when you finally get everyone into a room and you have the opportunity, you know, an hour, only an hour to train with other human beings in the way that this sport is intended to be trained, it seems really dumb to be spending that time focusing on doing drills, right? I mean, it feels like if I want to work on my strength and conditioning, like I don't need all of these people in the same room with me here to do that. I can just go do that at home. But if I want to do jujitsu, this is my window to do it. And so I, I think that maximizing the use of that class time is, is very, very important. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, you know, I think you or you holds example is a great example of trying to do, you know, technique in a bit different way. And, you know, for the soccer example I gave, like, instead of doing around cones, what we like to do is have kids play tag. So they're dribble, controlling the ball while trying to tag another player with their hand. Nice. So they're not, it's not like soccer at all, but it's coupled, right? You're, I'm moving because you're moving. To me, that's one of the most critical things you want to try to keep in as much of practice. Like, like you said, it's, it's a opponent po sport, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, 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 the critical, you, you're right. It's what you do relative your, to your opponent is the whole thing, <laughs> right? I mean, you can come up with your own great strategies on your own, but so as much as you can keep that there, even if you really simplify what you're doing with your opponent, I think it's better. Yeah, the only time I've really found drills to be useful is if you're you're so new at something that you can't even move your body in the way that it needs to move. And that that does happen a lot in jujitsu. Jujitsu involves using all of the weapons of your body. So mm -hmm. you have to be simultaneously coordinating your your hips, your shoulders, both of your arms, both of your legs, even your head. And it's very, very challenging to do that. If you see a new move for the first time, it can be very hard to remember where everything goes. So I find that drilling might be helpful right out of the gate if something is so alien to you that you actually can't even remember how all of the parts of your body move. But once <laughs> yeah. you get past that part, there's very limited utility in terms of using drilling in jujitsu because so much of jujitsu is all dependent on what your opponent does and how they resist. You know, you can move your arms and legs and your head exactly the way that you're supposed to move them to do a technique. But if your opponent just refuses to bust, <laughs> you know, you kind yes. of need a, a plan B, and that happens a lot in jujitsu. There's a lot of variables towards whether something works or not. So I think getting you doing your training with a real human being is probably the best use of the classroom time. Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question here on the topic of constraints led approach. You mentioned that a big part of what you're doing here is the coach is identifying an area where a student might be weak and might need help. And you're kind of building a game around that by creating constraints and removing some of the elements of the sport itself to focus on getting them to, to do the things that you want them to do. How do you do that in practice? Is it a situation where the coach comes in and they say at the beginning of the day, they set the same constraints for everybody? Or does the coach have to be paying attention to every single student and setting different constraints for every single person? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I think for the, a lot of times I think you can do it for everybody because it's allowing, you know, kind of individual that I guess it depends on how specific your goal is. Like, you know, if you're, you know, a soccer coach and you want to make everybody, I want you to move the ball quicker. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's kind of general things I think that are better, you know, can work on for everybody. You know, I want you to, you know, get a hold of your, your opponent faster, get a, a grasp. You know, I think everyone could benefit but for that but then though i'm sure there there are times when you have like my my connection ball example where there's an individual athlete with a specific technique that you can you probably want to focus on them separately if you can. So I, I think in both cases, but I think there's a lot that you can do kind of general ones. And I know in a lot of the sports that I work with, people are using it. They do the whole team level. And mm -hmm. I like to use the, the what I, I tend to do with coaches is I like to do a process where we make this, I call it, you know, people call it a constraints matrix where you, you start kind of writing out the things that you could manipulate in practice, you know, the spacing, the timing, 
rules about what you can do, you know, the equipment, so on. And then kind of match that up with what you, you know, the, t- the term we use a lot in, in is the affordances. What, what opportunities is it going to create for the athlete? What is going to take away from them? And kind of create this kind of table. And I think that thought process of doing that is as valuable as everything, but that's what I kind of like to do. And then in practice, you kind of, okay, we want to work on this. You know, I see the students are, are weak on this. Let, here's a constraint, I think. And you, you'll find as a coach, sometimes they don't work at all. You'll come up with something you think will make athletes do this and they don't do it at all. And so you either have to adjust it or try something different. But that's kind of the approach that I like to use. It's a very kind of iterative. You have to kind of change on the go. And and you're right. For certain times, it's, it can be very individualistic for sure. Yeah, I I can just see the individualistic thing being maybe just prohibitive in terms of the amount of work that it puts Mm -hmm. on the coach. And also, ultimately, if it's a sport where you are doing it in conjunction with another person, it could be difficult if person A has one set of constraints and person B has a different set of constraints. It might be Mm -hmm. logistically hard to make the game work, although that can be interesting. And that is something that you see sometimes in jujitsu where you will say, "Okay, person A, you have this constraint. Person B, you have this constraint. Go. (laughs) And it, it can lead to very weird, interesting results. Yeah, no, that would be that would be very interesting. I think that would be fun, uh, you, especially if they didn't know each other what, what each other had on them. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I think you're you're probably right. Depending on the practice, and if you have someone that has a real weakness or something, maybe you know that's a time to say you know you need extra or here's some you know thing else you can work on. But but you're right, it 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 is a, a lot a lot more work to work on an individual one. Well, let me ask you a question here when it comes to the student's role in setting these constraints. Once you've been doing a a sport for long enough, you often are pretty in tune with the areas that you're weak in, especially once you get up to the more advanced level. You might be totally aware, especially in a a combat sport like jujitsu, you may be totally aware of what you're doing wrong because you get a lot of very immediate feedback in a combat sport if something isn't working well. So it is often the case that someone might know right out of the gate, okay, I am bad at this one area of the sport. So theoretically, they could even set their own constraints rather than relying mm-hmm. on their coach to do it. And I'd love to maybe get your feeling on this. What What's the process of doing this if you want to self-direct? Is there any best practice for identifying the areas that you're weak in and creating constraints for yourself? Like, is, is that something that you can apply at an individual level or does it really require a coach to step in and manage the process? Yeah, that's a good, a great question. I, the term a lot of people like to use in this area, you know, is co-adaptive, you know, to, it's the coach and the athlete working together, right, as a, a more, instead of the coach having all the answers. So there's definitely a role for, for the athletes to come up with. I think, you know, maybe I, I would definitely, if, if you wanted to do that as an individual athlete, I think at the very least I would start with a coach to help you the go through the process of setting the practice, evaluating, you know, reflecting on it, what worked, what didn't, what I'm weak at, what not. I think because in general, what we find, you know, in research wise, people aren't the best at evaluating themselves sometimes, what they need to work on. People tend to like to practice what they're already good at mm-hmm. instead of things that really challenge them. So I think you can get good at that. I think, you know, a lot of the really great athletes are like that, but I think it's a process that a coach can help you with as well. Like how a coach can help you coach yourself, I think. Yeah. So I think, I think it, I wouldn't just rush off completely by myself and try to, to do everything. I think going through that process, sometimes we call it self-regulation in sports. So setting your goals, designing the practice to set the goals, and then reflecting on to what extent you achieve them. That's a pretty involved process. And I think getting some feedback on, on are you doing it realistically and things from a coach, I think would be valuable. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is really interesting. And, you know, you brought up that people are often reliant on their their a game they kind of do the things that they're used to doing and what i find is that sometimes this can make people resistant to change i see a lot of people and myself included who make the mistake of relying on the stuff that's always worked for them in the past and the problem is that that can prevent you from growing or adding new things onto your onto your skill set because if you're just doing the things that you know you've had success with then you're kind of going to have trouble integrating anything new because if you try something new you're not going to be good at it at first so this mm-hmm. creates this weird awkward dynamic where 
I've got these things that I'm already good at and I can do. And so I want to do them. But if I try to bolt on something new, I'm going to be bad at it out of the gate and is more comfortable to rely on the stuff that's tried and true for me. And that always worked. So I could uh, one of the, the values that I see of the constraints led approach is that you can often remove your A game. You can constrain yourself in that manner so that it focuses you to work on the weaknesses in your game. So an example is in the world of jujitsu, maybe there's a chokehold that you're just really good at, but you're so good at it that it's kind of become a crutch and it's preventing mm. you from learning new things. You can set up a constraint for yourself where you say, today in sparring, I will not use this move that I'm good at. And by doing that, that forces you to use the things that you're less good at and to put yourself into a situation where, yeah, you might lose but you might actually wind up better off at the end of the day because you were able to develop new skills. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a great point, Steve. And I, yes, we do that all the time, kind of, you know, especially when you're working with really, you know, really talented athletes, young, sometimes they're ahead of the game in terms of strength and something and just blow, you know, use strength against an opponent all the time. One thing I worked on for many years is still a little in, in American football. I, I call it the Tim Tebow problem. I mean, Tim Tebow was a college football quarterback who was very good in college, but he had a kind of this technical problem. He held the ball too low and it took him a little bit longer to get it out and throw, which wasn't a problem in college. But when you get to the pros where the constraints are changed, right? The athletes are faster. He was getting sacked. You couldn't get the ball out. So you're right. When they're good at it, when it works all the time, it, it really, you have to give them a reason not to use it. And, and the, the, mm -hmm. I think the constraints that approach, and I think that's also a really important point there for a coach setting the environment where failing is okay, right? Making mistakes is okay. We're exploring new techniques. We're supposed to fail. You're not supposed to look perfect in practice all the time. Looking perfect all the time doesn't mean you, it means you're not learning anything. So I, I think it's really, coaches have to set that expectation on these kind of things that, you know, struggling is okay. That's when you're going to learn. I got a question for you. Are you familiar with the book, The Art of Learning by Josh Waitskin? Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't think I, I, I've seen it, but I don't think I've read it in any detail. No. So it's, it's a book that I personally love. We've talked about it quite a bit. Josh is quite well known in the jujitsu space because among his other accomplishments, he's a jujitsu black belt. And he wrote this book where he basically talks about how he was able to rapidly learn several different on their surface, completely unrelated skill sets and become world class at all of them. So he lays out his, his framework for learning. Now, what's interesting is that in his book, I mean, Josh does not come across as the, you know, the way that he writes things, he writes them very much in kind of traditional martial arts language. Things kind of sound very, very spiritual in a lot of ways in terms of the way he writes them. They don't sound like they're grounded in research studies. But what I do find interesting is that at the end of the day, a lot of the concepts that he talks about actually map back very closely to what sports scientists will recommend. So one of the things that he talks about is investing in a loss, this idea that you have to view losing as an investment and looking bad as an investment, because if you just rely on the things that have always worked for you in the past, that can become a crutch. And it is hard to tell a really good athlete, don't do this thing that's working for you. But the nice thing about a constraints led approach is that it's much more objective. You're not arguing with the athlete about whether they should or shouldn't do something. You're just changing the game. You're setting a rule mm -hmm. for the game where they can't do that thing. And yeah. that can be very, very helpful. I mean, it if you've got someone in your gym, for example, who's really good at arm bars, and then the coach says, today you can't do arm bars is going to completely change the way they train for that day. And you do that long enough. And now this person's going to have a lot of other tools in their toolbox. Yeah, no, I agree. And yeah, it's kind of moving beyond the traditional, you know, we just instruct it, try to do not use this. <laughs> People don't really listen, you know, they, whereas you, you set, you know, we're competitive, you change the constraints, like rules are a constraint. So mm -hmm. you lose minus one point if you do this and get two points if you do anything else. You, you're right, you're going to push people to try different things by, by setting it kind of a, objectively. Yeah, I think that's it. That, that sounds like a really interesting book. I have to check that out.
I think you'd like it. I mean, it's it's not a book that's going to be loaded up with a lot of research studies, but from what I've found and talking to a lot of high level athletes, the concepts that he talks about, they're mapped quite closely to best practices in various sports. So Josh is an interesting guy because he's a world champion. I think he's a chess grandmaster. He's actually, okay. he won as a kid. He was the inspiration for the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer. He then went on and won a competitive Tai Chi tournament, and he's also a high level Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. So he's kind of a guy who who's sort of a renaissance man. He's gone around and yeah. succeeded at a bunch of different things. <laughs> and he talks about the methods that he uses. It's really interesting. Yeah, no, I, I think as I, I said at the start, I, I am really interested in hearing kind of how people have, you know, either through coaches or themselves kind of learned methods to acquire skill. You, there's a lot of synergy between the research and the theory and what people are figuring out kind of on their own and what works and what doesn't. I think they, they connect nicely in a lot of ways. One thing I would like to get your opinion on is how do you introduce a constraints led approach into an environment where there might be resistance to such a thing? There's a lot of traditionalism in terms of the way people teach in mm -hmm. our sport here, where people often they, they haven't really put a lot of thought into the way that they teach or structure class. They just do it by copying what their instructor did and often it's not very question. You can go to jujitsu gyms around the world and a lot of them are going to use the same three-part structure where you come in for 60 to 90 minutes and the first third of the class is basically a warm-up. The second third of the class is instructor shows three techniques and the students copy him and then the third of the class is live sparring and almost <laughs> at least it feels like <laughs> almost every jiu-jitsu club in the world basically structures things the same way so and in some cases too when you go to a club if they are part of a larger affiliation they might even have their class structure prescribed to them from the parent affiliation so what i'm wondering is if how how do you get past that that objection and that inertia where people don't want to try something new? Is there a an argument that you can use to convince people that they should give a constraints approach a, a chance as opposed to just doing things in, you know, like a Groundhog Day fashion where you're just kind of repeating the same mistakes over and over again? Any suggestions on how to implement this thing where there's resistance? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think it's um that's an interesting point. I think you know I found it, it varies from people to people. You know how much they want to buy into. I, I I think I've seen two ways. One one is if you have a kind of a really kind of standard constraints manipulation that has worked a lot in sports. You know, just getting someone to try one session of it. You know, and s seeing what's happening. You know the and staying out of it <laughs> without getting too instructive, which is a big challenge in and of itself. I found that I have this weird. This sounds kind of really hokey, but I've had a lot of people tell me that when they adopt these kind of approaches, there's a noticeable change even in the sound in the room. Right, the the people there's more talking, there's more communication among the athletes. It, it just changes things. So I always find if you can get people to like try one kind of uh, tried and true willing like small sided games and soccer or changing the spaces uh, you know depending on on that i i found that the other thing i sometimes say is i think like variability adding variability to practice is kind of the gateway <laughs> to mm -hmm. this uh so y y if you're very restrictive and you're kind of prescriptive and you're really resistant i try to get them okay well let's how can we vary what you're doing a little bit let's change the angles and the distances and mix things up and i find that that and people kind of see the benefits of that and it can kind of slowly move them in the direction of this but you know it, it is sometimes hard people are, <laughs> want to stick with what they're used to and what they're comfortable with that you as you said at the start it's not a not the easiest method to use you know just automatically jumping in there. So I, I understand the resistance for sure. Yeah, it's it's a lot more challenging for a coach because they have to really think in depth and almost reverse engineer what they want to teach. Mm. If I have a technique I want to teach and all I want to do is go in and show you and then tell you to copy me, that requires pretty little effort on the part of the coach to put that together. Mm -hmm. But if I want to do a constraints led approach, I need to reverse engineer the whole thing. I need mm -hmm. to come in and say, OK, I've noticed that my students have a weakness in this area or they're making a mistake. So I need to reverse engineer a game around that that mistake rather than just telling them to do something. So it requires a kind of a, a second order of planning that might feel very unnatural to people if they're doing it for the first time. For sure. Yeah. And a lot of the, 
you know, the consulting, a lot of what I do is just getting people to ask why. <laughs> why do you always do that warm-up drill? What is it? And an important point that comes from that is, right, not all practice is meant to be focused on this big skill acquisition and learning. Like, that's super demanding on people. It's okay to have some practice that where you focus on just making people confident and comfortable, mm -hmm. right? So it's very, you might have something that's kind of a bit more repetitive, but as long as you know that's what you're doing, I think like the example like you gave, I think a lot of the practice we've lost thinking about why we're doing this and just that's all the, the way we've always done it is probably the, the answer people would give you. Whereas one, if you're right, if you put more thought, what, what exactly am I trying to achieve today yeah. <laughs> in this practice? I think we would be, be just better off by asking that question. Yeah, yeah. There is a lot of traditionalism and doing things the way that it was always done. And, and you can kind of adopt a lot of habits mm -hmm. that really don't actually serve any purpose, but you're only just doing them because at some point someone else told you to do them. And shedding a lot of that stuff and focusing on things that have a reason for being done can be a real game changer for a lot of gyms. Mm -hmm. I try to keep a very constant eye on what I'm doing and why I'm doing it to try to figure out, okay, am I actually doing this for a reason? Mm -hmm. Is this something that actually is serving me and making me better? Or maybe is this something that was sensible for me to do when I was newer, but now that I'm more experienced, it actually doesn't make sense for me to do this. That's uh, one of the nice things about a constraints approach too, is that it can help you look at old habits you may have acquired that might have made sense at the time. Mm hmm but now they just don't make sense anymore. In the jujitsu world, you talked earlier about how when you're a beginner, you can kind of get away with things. And that is very much the case in jujitsu. You can have game plans at the junior levels that have massive gaping holes in them, but you can get away with them because your opponent also has massive gaping holes in their game plan. But once you're fighting experienced people, they don't leave those kinds of holes. So you might find that, okay, a lot of the things that I was doing before, I have to abandon those and tighten up the ship. There might be even entire sections of your game plan that simply don't work at a high level because they assume that your opponent has these big gaping holes that you're just not going to find anymore. Yeah. It reminded me of it, you know, and from your name of your sport, there's some wonderful research going on now looking at Brazilian soccer, uh, kind of how people learn to play soccer in Brazil. And most people, if you know, Brazil is known for developing some of the most creative soccer players in the world. But what it's shown is that it, where in other places, like in Europe and in North America, we have these academies that are very organized and structured. They play this street game called Pelada. A lot of players are famously like Pele, where they're playing on the street with rough ball or a beach. And importantly, your example, they actually mix ages and sizes in the games. Like, so you can't, you're not like playing against little kids all the time when you're stronger and you kind of have to learn to adjust and adapt. So it's people have been you know, thinking that's kind of what's helped to develop them. So yeah, I think, I think that's a really good point as you, you know, you grow, you have to change. And that's a, that's an important point through all of this. It's adaptive, like it's constant being skillful is a constant adaptation to your environment and just it. And so the idea is if you start that way, then you just keep doing it as, as things change. And then as you get older, you get slower and less flexible. Like I am right now, <laughs> I'm having to adapt to these new constraints as well. Yeah. Do you find that when you're trying to pick up a skill, that kind of variability is, is helpful? Because in jujitsu, one of the main variables that you're going to deal with is the size of your opponent. You might be bigger, mm -hmm. you might be smaller, you might be roughly the same. Do you find that it is good to have that kind of variability when you're trying to improve? Yeah, I think up to a certain degree. I think you, I'm a really big believer in adding variability to practice. Uh, you know, I do it in all the kind of sports I work in, you know, in baseball, varying the pitch speeds and the type of pitches. And to a degree, though, you don't want to overwhelm a new learner with variability. So you kind of have to scale it up based on, on how skilled they are, I think. But I, I really am a strong believer that, you know, you, you, you learn, you're learning to, what I, I tend to, the traditional way is we teach, I call it adjustability. I'm going to teach you the correct technique and how to punch, and then you're going to, or grasp, and then you're going to have to adjust it. 
for different heights mm-hmm. <laughs> of a, whoever your face or side. Whereas what we're trying to do with the constraints led approach is more adaptability. I'm just going to teach you how to relate your movements to the size of your opponent right from the start, right? So you you know it's it's a coupled skill rather than a basic skill that you need to adjust under different conditions. So so I do think it's really important to get that in as early as possible. I really like that example of adaptability. It's a, a lesson that took me way too long to learn in this sport. <laughs> um, yeah. the, an example I can give, is, there's a move in jiu-jitsu called the triangle choke. Basically, it's where you're on your back and you use your legs to choke your opponent. And it's a move that can work very effectively against an opponent who's roughly the same size as you or... It works very well against an opponent who's smaller, but if you're fighting a much bigger opponent, it's very hard to do this because they can just squish you <laughs> if there's a lot of weight <laughs> or they can just even they can just pick you up. This this is a mm-hmm. common problem. You'll see you'll see this sometimes in a, in MMA where someone attempts this choke and then if the person is big and strong, they can just pick that person up and carry them and even <laughs> throw them. So it, it can be dangerous and it, it's a tricky situation because on one hand, you want to train to accommodate your goals. If your if your goal in jiu-jitsu is to fight people your own size because it's a sport that generally has weight classes, then mm-hmm. It's good to train with people who resemble the opponents you're going to fight in a tournament. If you're not going to fight in an open weight tournament, there's not a lot of benefit in you from a sports standpoint, perhaps in fighting these big, strong guys. At least it wouldn't seem that way. You want to get used to fighting people your own size. But on the other hand, Fighting those big, strong guys who are way bigger than you can add a whole new level that you didn't even expect. Because like you said, if you're trying to just do a move and adjust it for their height, you're not really looking at the underlying concepts. It's better to teach people how to move and then they can kind of fill in the specifics around them. And what I found is there's certain moves that I simply, they're too much of a gamble to do against a big, strong person. So I take them out of my game when I'm fighting someone who's that much bigger. And a lot of that just comes down to awareness of how the body works and when something is a good idea and when it's not Mm -hmm. yeah definitely and that's kind of the the kind of the one of the principles underlying the the constraints that approach is you know that there's information in the environment from your opponent that you can pick up that tells you what opportunities for action are here you know is this type of hold is this available is this not it's not so much a cognitive thing where you're learning i have to remember Oh, when this person has this height, I can do this. It's more direct. If you if you practice in the right way, you can learn to kind of pick up from your opponent what's going to work, <laughs> what 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 opportunities are there. Yeah, awesome. I suppose another question. You know, we've talked about the constraints led approach and how useful it can be. I suppose another question that relates is: Are there situations where you would not want to use this approach? Are there situations where maybe something more directly instructive is better than the constraints led approach, or is this something that you would universally recommend? Yeah, I think it's it's quite a broad methodology because I think one another common kind of misconception I, I hear people is that you know it's silent coaching, right? You're not allowed to say anything. What you say is a type of constraint. It's an informational constraint, you know, so you can step in and and kind of guide the athlete when you don't like what you're seeing by what you're saying. I think we want to say things in a different way than we used to, not as prescriptive and bodily focused. So I I think it's most kind of, you, you can use it in a lot of different situations. The other one that we haven't really talked about that I find helps in some situations can be difficult to think of the exact constraint to get what you want or the athletes not really seem to finding a good solution. One other methodology that has similar purpose to kind of promote this self-organization is differential learning, where you're really adding just kind of variability. I call it variability for variability stake, which the event <laughs> Wolfgang Schulhorn, who invented it, hates when I say that. But w- what you're trying to do is just get the athlete to try moves, start your grasp from with your right foot back, then your left foot back, and then your hands low, and then your hands high. You're basically getting them to explore lots of different random movements and body postures instead of adding a constraint to get them to move in a particular way. I find that can be effective when you, when the constraints don't seem to be working. Um, but all the other traditional methods like instruction, observation, which we've kind of talked a little bit where you're demonstrating, I think those fit fully within the constraints that approach. Um, it's just kind of an overall philosophy, I think, to coaching. 
Right. It, it seems almost uh, Socratic in the way that it works. Right. It sounds like you're mm-hmm. you're not being as instructive, but rather you're trying to get your people to get to the right answer their own way. And your job as the coach is to put some guidelines that are just likely to steer them in the direction you're hoping they'll go. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like the, the term guide. Right? You're when you guide someone, you, you're letting them experience it for themselves. Right. Like when you're a guide on a tour guide or something, you, you you want them, they're seeing it and learning it for themselves. You're just taking them there, <laughs> helping mm-hmm. them get there. You're not telling them, you know, everything. So I, I think that's a good a word I like to use. Yeah. Got it. I wonder, do you feel this approach has applicability outside of sports? I mean, I'd love to know, can, can you use the constraints led approach? If you are say a manager at work, can you use that to coach people in non-physical endeavors so that they can skill develop? Or is it something that is specifically most useful in a, a physical environment? Yeah, no, I think it, it does. I think, you know, I know some people have started talking about education. How can we import this in I've t- occasionally I try to in parenting, I try to <laughs> see if I can implement it. So when I tell my daughter, don't do that, I'm actually implementing a constraints led approach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just has, to me, it has a lot of, of benefits, like beyond, you know, it promotes autonomy, right? If I just give you, here's my constraints that I want you to satisfy, I'm not telling you how to do it. I want you to figure out how to do it. It's just more rewarding. And I think for people, so I, I do believe it, it can, you can apply it to a lot of things in life and a lot of different other areas. You know, I think we be stifle a lot of creativity and decision making and stuff mm-hmm. because we think we know the right way to do things all the time. Whereas if we let people just, you know, here's some constraints you have to satisfy. I think maybe good bosses do that already. I think a lot of times I, I would in, be inclined to agree. Right. I mean, when your boss comes in and tells you exactly what to do and how to do it, that's called micromanaging. And I don't know many people who like being micromanaged. Mm hmm. So I think, you know, I, it's one of the reasons, you know, I chose my, <laughs> I like having, you know, targets, you, you know, I have to meet, but not anyone telling me what hours I have to work <laughs> and that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I think it's a good, you know, general philosophy for learning and, and performing in a lot of domains. Well, I feel like we've covered a good introduction here, Rob. Is there anything we missed or any other closing thoughts on the constraint led approach that you want to put in before we wrap this up? Um, no, I think, you know, I could do plug, a, you know, I've set up a, a, off my the website you mentioned, perceptionaction.com. I set, I've kind of, I call it a resource page for this. I've, I've set up a links with all the podcast episodes I've done on it and the articles and, and, and things. And I guess the, the one that's got me really excited is that we didn't touch on too much is that, you know, doing these kind of constraints led approach and things where you're encouraging the athlete to be more variable in their movements and explore is actually a route to reducing injury Mm -hmm. too. There's growing body of evidence to show that, you know, doing, trying to do the same one technique is actually what promotes injury. Whereas allowing people to do the same thing in different ways is actually going to to tell prevent injury and and rehab them. So I think that's an exciting aspect of it for me that, That's interesting. I I wouldn't have expected that, but it makes sense when you say that because it you're discouraging repetitive stress injury. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You're you're trying to get people. And there's a there's for example, there's a recent soccer study that I, I review that uh, they uh, looked at markers for ACL injury, you know, before and after different types of training, and they showed you know the constraints really did reduce the amount of force people were putting on their body and because because they're yeah and they were using just different distributing the force in different ways so i I think that's a really exciting aspect of it too so with all that said then rob if people want to learn more about this i know of course that you've got an awesome podcast on the matter and an awesome Mm -hmm. website full of resources here where can people find your work yeah, so the the basic place to get there is is perceptionaction.com, you know, the the my podcast is there. I do a YouTube, I do some video review of views of articles and occasionally we have like journal clubs where I get people on to talk about this and and coaches. So and then as I mentioned, the, if it's particularly the constraints led approach, I would encourage you to to have a look at that that resource page. Um there's some growing body of of research of uh, materials out there. One of the one you mentioned, I think maybe it was off the air we were talking talking about the Ian Renshaw book. So mm-hmm. kind of the higher level is if you want to dive into is the dynamics of skill acquisition book, mm-hmm. but the, on the low, you know, more practical level, uh, there's a uh, books. One of the ones I really like is actually the constraints led approach to golf coaching, which is a recent book, which sounds like why I'm not a golfer. <laughs> why would I care? But it really 
outlays the logic of it out really well and shows it how it translates into specific examples. And so I like that book as well. And all those kind of resources are linked on that page that I mentioned. So, so that's where I would, I would go there for sure. Fantastic. And if anyone wants to check out more of our work, you can go to BJJ Mental Models Premium. The way you do that is premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. That is an awesome service that we set up. If you really want to take the stuff and apply it to the next level in the world of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there's a ton of premium courseware and content that I put together there with a lot of guest hosts, of course, including my brother, Matt. We also offer rolling review footage. Send me your footage and we'll break it down in detail. You also get to be part of our awesome Discord community. Really one of the the main perks of joining again highly recommend you at least check it out first week is free if and you can cancel any time that's premium.bjjmentalmodels.com if you want to check it out or you can support us on patreon if you just want to kick us a little bit of cash patreon.com slash bjjmentalmodels rob thanks so much man i'm really glad to have you on here i've been looking forward to this chat for a long time and i think it's a really interesting topic that's gonna give a lot of people some cool ideas about how they can be better learners yeah, no, thank you very much, Steve. It was my pleasure. And yeah, I'm a really, I really think it's a really fun way to coach and really, really enjoyable thing to explore. So I hope uh, we do people get more into it for sure. <laughs> Fantastic. And of course, to all the listeners, as always, thanks again for hanging out with us this week. And we'll talk to you guys next week. 